Hello and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the southeast. Heartbreak as burglars steal the £3,000 a terminally ill Kent pensioner had saved for his funeral. And I went without a lot of things just to save it up because I didn't want the burden of my funeral on any of my relatives. The quest for the perfect smile turns to despair for thousands of Britons flying abroad for cheap dental treatment. A warning tonight. In my mind, when we see these patients, I see it as dental mutilation. Also this evening, the Sussex village facing weeks of flooding. And remember these cutting-edge technology in the 1960s and helping to solve crime in Sussex. But the fax machine's days are numbered. We look back at its history. Good evening. A Kent pensioner with terminal cancer saved up thousands of pounds for his funeral, only to have the money stolen during a break-in. Terry Price was out shopping when his home in Ramsgate was burgled. Tonight, police are appealing for anyone with information about the thief or thieves to come forward. Megan Samurai has more. They come through that window over there. There was a cable going out so I could charge me scooters up. Years of savings, now gone. More than £3,000 was hidden under Terry's bed before he was burgled. How long have you been saving that money? Ever since I found out my illness in 2019. Because before that, I couldn't save to save my life. But I just thought I have to, because I didn't want the burden of my funeral on any of my relatives. Popping out on his scooter to the shops for just 45 minutes, Terry thinks he was robbed by someone he knew. Yeah, they, they knew where it was, because they went straight to it. No one else would have done it. They, if it was an ordinary burglary, they would have tried to tell you everything. But it, it was a setup. I'm, I swear it was a setup. It's just callous. I can't think of any other words. They're absolute scum. And I hope they get caught. I really do hope they get caught. The public can help in this investigation if, if they know who has committed this, if someone has come home with a large amount of money, I would encourage them to report it to Margate Police Station, to Crime Stoppers, because burglaries are a real invasion of privacy. This was a vulnerable adult, um, and to steal this money from him is it's fairly despicable, to be honest. Since the burglary, Terry's neighbour Zoe has set up a fundraiser that's now raised more than £1,000. Every time it's talked about, like, the funds and all that, when Zoe tells me, I break down. Because I can't handle it. The generosity, basically. Yeah, and it's unbelievable. And the, the list of names is unreal. I've never heard of some of them. But a lot of them are ex-neighbours as well that have moved out of here years ago. But they still remember me. I've got more faith in the public than I have in the law and the government. Megan Samurai with our report there. And remember, there is more news from right across the southeast on our website, itv.com forward slash meridian. A man's died after a collision between a car and lorry carrying waste in Medway. Kent police are appealing for witnesses to the collision yesterday afternoon at the junction of Station Road and Frinsbury Road in Strood. A 40-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving. More than 2,000 jobs could be created on the Hoo Peninsula in Kent after plans to redevelop the former Kings North Power Station were approved. German company Unipus say the Medway One development could accommodate commercial, manufacturing, industrial and energy businesses. Nine gates at the Nashenden Down Nature Reserve in Rochester have been stolen, leaving more than 200 animals at risk of escape and injury. 
Kent Wildlife Trust says it will cost the charity around £10,000 to replace and have had to put up temporary gates in the meantime to protect their sheep and pigs. Drivers in Kent are facing disruption this weekend, with part of the M2 closed for roadworks. It will be shut between Junction 4 in Gillingham and Junction 7 at Brenley Corner overnight on Sunday between 8pm and 6am. Yesterday, many homes, villages and towns in our region were struggling with flooding and today some remain underwater. Alfriston in Sussex and Herne Bay in Kent were particularly affected following torrential rain on Wednesday night with the River Cookmere bursting its banks. In some areas the clean-up has begun but for others the water is a long way from subsiding. Andy Dickinson has more. Day two after the deluge and some parts of our region remain underwater. The village of Alfriston still cut off from the north with floodwaters barely having receded in 24 hours. Went most of the way up the lane um, and we couldn't get our cars in um, and I had to, uh, had to uh, wade through to get to the front door. Alfriston often gets flooded but it does seem to be getting more frequent um, and worse over the last couple of years. Well, as you can see, the water levels here remain very high. Thankfully, most properties in Alfriston are protected from the flooding. But at the moment, this water has nowhere to go. It's thought it could remain here for days, possibly even weeks. Well, it's, uh, it's quite unusual, I think, for this time of year, yes, for November. Usually we get it in January, February a little bit. And obviously, for some residents, it's very, very bad. The people over there, for instance, they've been flooded out, I expect. Uh, and the road has been closed, so that's very disruptive for people. In the summer, there's virtually, you know, the river just gets down to about one foot, two foot, three foot wide. And look at it now. Meanwhile, in Hearn Bay, some businesses have closed and several families have had to be moved into temporary accommodation as the clean-up begins. That can happen even tonight again. As I saw the rainfall and the forecast of the weather, and last night I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep, I was literally like listening if is any more water coming. Southern Water say they're on site in Kent working to support their customers. Many across the southeast now looking to the heavens and wondering what the next downpour will bring. Andy Dickinson, ITV News, Alfriston. A young couple from Kent who recently lost twin boys returned to the hospital that helped them through their heartbreaking experience. Lauren Jewis and Paul Burr joined other parents at the Medway Maritime Hospital in Gillingham for World Prematurity Awareness Day. As Glenn Tomsett reports, the hospital also has a new piece of equipment to help with the birth of premature babies. The 17th of November was World Prematurity Awareness Day, an event to highlight the challenges of preterm birth. For Lauren and her partner Paul, the day holds a special place in their hearts. The couple from Hoo near Rochester lost twin boys who were born prematurely in 2020. Unfortunately, Zach passed away after three days and Jackson passed away after 37 days. Um, we left it a while before we decided to try again. Uh, we found out on the 15th of May, I think it was, 2021, we was pregnant again. And it would never be twins. And we thought, no. Because we thought that that never happened again. <laughs> For Lauren and Paul and thousands of others in a similar situation, they say the care and comfort they received from the staff of the Oliver Fisher Baby Care Unit was second to none. We look after the medical care of the baby as well as the support the family for them to be a part of their baby's care right from day one for them to get involved and do things they would have done if they were born at term or they were well and they were at home. Well one vital piece of equipment that's fairly new to this hospital and indeed hospitals across the UK is this here at the Oliver Fisher neonatal unit. This is a resuscitator uh, for babies, premature babies. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, how does it yes. work? By leaving the cord attached to the placenta when babies are delivered for up to a minute um, has lots of health benefits for preterm babies, um, reduces mortality rate by up to a third. Um, so this unit allows us to, once the baby's delivered, the cord will stay attached to the placenta while allowing us to also give the baby some rescue breaths to start resuscitating. With this new life start machine, staff can now offer optimal umbilical cord management to all preterm babies, something that's become part of their everyday routine practice. 
Glenn Thompson, ITV News, Gillingham. You're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Still to come tonight, Sarah's here with all the sport as we gear up for the Qatar World Cup starting on Sunday. And the K2 Leisure Centre in Crawley will become home to the first ever Down Syndrome British Swimming Championships tomorrow in what is a huge moment for disability sport. I'll be here to preview the event with some of our South East swimming stars. Look forward to that. Remember, you can find more news from across the South East on our website, itv.com forward slash Meridian. You can call us the numbers on your screen now, 0808 1010 095. And why not give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Now, the growing celebrity and social media trend for perfectly straight white teeth has led to thousands of Britons flying abroad in search of cheap dental surgery to transform their smile. But often the result is not what was advertised and people are left in excruciating pain with their natural teeth in ruins. Now, an Eastbourne dentist has joined others across the UK to warn about the dangers of getting invasive oral surgery abroad. Amrit Birdie has more. But when you touch a nut, it's so slight. Model Katie Price often shares the details of her yeah. trips abroad for dental work with her millions of social media followers. She's part of a booming trend for dental tourism, which, when done well, can cut the cost of a brand new smile by thousands. But although many dentists abroad are highly qualified, some are performing dodgy and dangerous procedures on British tourists. Amanda Turner flew to Turkey earlier this year with a dream of getting perfect veneers fitted. But what she ended up with was a nightmare. I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink anything, even the breeze, the air going in through the little gaps. I was like, I was as if I was being electrocuted, it was just the shock pain um, nearly in almost every tooth in my mouth. I couldn't get a call back from any dentist because it was a mouthful of problems. It's taken 50 hours work so far to get me pain free and to where I am now. It's been the biggest mistake of my life. Amanda's story is far from unique, with the British Dental Association claiming nearly 90% of UK dentists have treated patients that develop problems following treatment abroad. Dentist Akit Patel in Eastbourne says people need to be careful of being lured in by cheap dental packages online. The main reason for dental tourism is cost. Um, and I mean, sometimes they throw in a holiday, but the, the treatment cost is a fraction of having that treatment here in the UK. What's worrying is people are sharing their results, either on social media or face to face, um, without sharing the full story. And this has uh, glamorized and created unrealistic expectations about dental tourism. It is, um, it's a dangerous territory. Dodgy dental work done abroad cannot always be fixed on the NHS, meaning people can spend thousands more getting their teeth rectified by a UK cosmetic dentist than they spent getting the work done in the first place. One of the biggest problems is that actually this treatment usually does not involve veneers. A veneer is a very, very thin layer of porcelain that gets attached to the front of the tooth. Unfortunately, they are having crowns which drill the whole of the surface of the tooth away. And that's very, very different. In my mind, when we see these patients, I see it as dental mutilation. And dental mutilation is something that's very difficult to fix because we cannot grow those teeth back. When fitted correctly, crowns can help relieve discomfort and improve the appearance of teeth. But the NHS advises people to think carefully before booking any treatment abroad. And the British Dental Association say checking a dentist's qualifications and experience is essential, as well as checking that they are insured if things do go wrong. Amrit Birdie, ITV News. Now a date has been set for next year's Brighton Half Marathon. 10,000 took part in this year's event, which was kicked off by Dame Kelly Holmes. Runners will take to the streets on the 26th of February. The event in its 33rd year is organised by the charity The Sussex Beacon. An annual autumn exhibition of Sussex-based artists is returning to Glyndebourne near Lewis. Fairground 2022 starts today and will feature more than 40 works by artists from across the country. It's running until early January. 
Now, changes are coming which could bring the death of the fax machine another step closer. Ofcom is changing the rules on what telecom services will be available throughout the country. One of those changes is removing the need for fax machines to work as phone lines switch to newer technology. And even though they are rare, there are still businesses where the fax machine is still vital. James Webster has been looking at their long and surprising history. This used to be the only way to get documents from one office to another. And at this solicitor's, they still need it to exchange some documents. Our fax machine did sadly die about six months ago. And at the time, our, our finance people were saying, do we really need to spend money on a new fax machine? Um, all of those of us in property were saying, we absolutely do. Um, and we had to get a fax machine straight away. It's, for us, it's such a secure way of sending documentation and for mortgage companies to send redemption figures to us. Um, for us, it's, it's a daily used piece of equipment. But soon there'll be no guarantee that faxes will still work as telephone wires move to new technology. The regulator Ofcom is consulting now on how and when those changes will be implemented. Over the next few years, the UK is switching over to digital phone services and fax cannot be guaranteed to work well on digital networks. So what we're proposing is to update the rules. Fax works today for many people, so it may well work into the future. We're just removing the obligation from the regulations to bring them up to date. Police chiefs all over Britain are watching with great interest the experiment by Sussex Constabulary with equipment for transmitting messages, maps and photographs direct to patrol cars. There was a time the fax machine was the latest innovation here helping Sussex police identify suspects in the 1960s. Back in the control room, a photograph of the suspect is fed into the transmitter together with other relevant details. But the technology is even older. Here, a prototype was being tested to send a cheque in the 1920s. With fewer fax machines now in offices, the items are highly sought after as exhibits at the Amberley Museum. Communications technology moves on quickly. What was once the latest gadget is soon superseded. And now it seems the latest item to be considered practically obsolete is the fax machine. This model here dating back to the late 1970s, now finding itself purely in a museum. Just how widespread would these have been in offices in their heyday? From the early 80s onwards, all the way through to the 90s, they would have been very widespread and yeah, widely used. And then obviously the widespread introduction of email and the World Wide Web meant people could then attach documents and send it via email or now via secure file sharing sites. And it's fascinating that until relatively recently this was in use and now it's sitting here in a museum. Yeah, it's now become a nostalgic item. What's this? It's a fax machine. Is it? Marvellous what they can do nowadays. It's many years since BT promoted sending faxes. Now the company says it supports Ofcom's changes with faxes being superseded by newer forms of communication. It will still be some time before museums are the only place to find a fax machine. But that day is moving closer as our phone lines are upgraded. James Webster, ITV News, Amberley. Do you remember them? Because I do. Oh, absolutely. It's amazing how it, it moves forward so quickly, technology, yeah, isn't it? It does. I remember being so, so nervous, though, because I never knew if I was getting the document the right way up. I always got it the wrong way. But they've gone. Um, the ITV Evening News continues here at 6.30. Here's Lucrezia Millerini. A woman who stood no chance. A man admits to murdering Zara Alina just days after he was released from prison. The law graduate was kicked, stamped on and left for dead after she was attacked on her way home from a night out in East London last summer. Also, the row over alcohol at the Qatar World Cup. Beer is now banned from stadiums just two days before the tournament kicks off. And Manchester United say they're taking appropriate steps against Cristiano Ronaldo following his explosive interview. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Yes, as they mentioned there, the World Cup coming up this weekend. 
Now the sport with Sarah Gom. Thanks very much, Andrew. Well, the Qatar World Cup does kick off on Sunday. The England squad have been training in the heat today ahead of their opening match against Iran on Monday. It is, though, a competition taking place amid controversy due to the host nation's stance on same-sex relationships and concerns over human rights and the treatment of migrant workers. Lioness's captain, Leah Williamson, today said she sadly has no interest in watching as a fan, although will support the England team. And fans from our region are heading out to Qatar, ready to cheer on Gareth Southgate's squad. Zero Accounting Software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. Glenn Simmons is travelling out with his son, brother and a couple of friends. He's been watching England at World Cups since Spain 82 and rarely misses a game home or away. The group are going to 11 matches in total. Glenn says he now simply couldn't miss a World Cup. Fly out on Sunday morning. We leave at three o'clock in the morning. I'm going to pick Aid up on, um, in the morning. We fly out to Heathrow for a seven o'clock flight. It's a six and a half hour flight to Qatar, plus the three hour time difference. We'll be there for six o'clock in the evening in our shorts with our suntan lotion on. We'll be ready. We've been to many World Cups. We've been to many World um, European Championships, finals, Nations League finals, everything. Just got to watch England. Got to keep going. Got to keep the faith. Well, the Premier League and Championship are heading into a break for the World Cup, but it is business as usual in Leagues 1 and 2. Gillingham look to improve their poor run of form when they travel to Newport tomorrow, and Crawley Town head to Walsall with a chance to move up into 17th place. Finally from me, swimmers in the southeast are preparing to take part in the first ever Down Syndrome British Championships in Crawley. The competition will be a first for athletes who are currently not represented in the Paralympics. More than 130 swimmers aged between 10 and 50 years will compete in the pool across 44 events. Our reporter Joe Caution sent this. Well, the K2 Leisure Centre here in Crawley is currently hosting swimming lessons for school children, but overnight it will become host to the first ever British Down Syndrome Swimming Championships. One of 135 swimmers competing this weekend is Kent's very own Jemima Rudd-Jones, who I'm delighted to say joins us on the programme now. Jemima, Hi. thanks ever so much for joining us. We can see you've got a bit of a heavy neck from where you're carrying some medals. What yeah. have you got there? Tell us what you've won. So my gold medal is for my 200 fly, and then my bronze was for the IM medley, and then I did the, fly, did the butterfly. So you're already the world champion in the butterfly. Yeah. The British Championships this weekend hopefully should be a breeze. How much would it mean to you to become the first ever British champion? It feels great to yeah. champ, yeah. And are you going to win a medal this weekend? I think I probably will. Well, we're hoping you are. We'll be cheering <laughs> you on, that's for sure. Jemima, thanks ever so much Thank for speaking you. to us. Well, of course, swimmers with Down syndrome can't compete in the Paralympics right now. There isn't a discipline, and this event hopes to change that. Neil Lacey is the chair of Down Syndrome Swimming GB. Neil, thanks ever so much for being with us. I hope you're, I hope you're thinking that this is the catalyst for change. Yes, we hope this is the showcase of um, British swimming um, for Down Syndrome swimmers. Um, we hope that the event will show that the S14 category, which they're currently in, um, is probably you know, not where they could, should be. We would like to see them in a fairer class. Um, which st it covers their physical disabilities as well, um, short stature, poor muscle tone, etc. We'd like to think that you know they could get a fairer class. We still like the fact that they can compete at S14, but we're not going to get to that Paralympic level. So hopefully one day, um, with this showcasing event here this weekend, it will be really you know really chuffed if that could be part of the evidence for it. So. Yeah, absolutely, a really important event. Neil, thanks ever so much for speaking to us. Full inclusion, the aim for the tournament then. Jemima's aim, I'm sure. Just to win some more silverware. We'll be cheering her on, I'm sure. We will indeed, Joe Caution reporting there. Good luck, Jemima. Everything crossed for more gold. Definitely. Sarah, thank you. Now, you may or may not want to hear this, but there are just 37 days to go until Christmas. Ouch. So before you prepare to dust off the decorations and start thinking about your own Christmas tree, 
We thought we'd pay a visit to a place they're not short of a pine tree or two. Yes, that's the Bedgebury Pine Eatum near Goudhurst, where their annual festive light trail opens to the public this evening. There for us is Kit Bradshaw. Kit, despite it being mid-November, it looks really festive there, and I must say you look very dapper, dappled in all those lights. Thank you, Sangeet. Yes, it's starting to look uh, pretty magical here. If you've not been, we're close to Tunbridge Wells, right on the Kent East Sussex border in 300 acres of forest, 12,000 pine trees, as you were saying. And at this time of year, they put on this festive trail where they're illuminated by different art installations and soundscapes you might be able to hear in the distance. And they've been doing it for five years now. One of the organisers from Forestry England is Patrick West. Patrick, you've been busy preparing for the opening night tonight. We can see the public are in uh, coming through behind us. Uh, how much preparation has been involved in an event like this? Yeah, evening, Kate. Yeah, lots of preparation. The team have been working really hard for about three weeks. About 14 different installations they've been setting up and hundreds of thousands of lights. And... Do you worry, you've obviously had the disruption of COVID over the, in the first five years of putting this event on, this year with the cost of Christmas will be a concern to so many people, do you think that might hit visitor numbers for a leisure event like this? Yeah, we're, we're very conscious about the sort of the cost of living crisis and, and households at the moment. So we do have reduced family tickets and we do offer sort of under twos for free. So we hope that that will be uh, something that allows many people as possible to come and visit the trail this year. And as an organisation like Forestry England, do you think events like this, light trails, we can see all those lit up Christmas trees in the distance behind you, do you think they're bringing people to a forest, a pine eatum like this, the National Pine Eatum, that wouldn't normally come to a, to a, a site like this? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we hope that if people are coming for the first time, they've never been to Bedgeby before or to Forestry England sites, that they come, experience it, enjoy themselves and come back another time and visit us during the day. Best of luck. Thank you for having us on the opening night. As you can see, people already arriving. And these light installation events are getting more and more popular. There's another one happening this weekend at Battle Abbey, also in our region. That's only for the weekend, though. This, this event is running all the way to the 2nd of January. Booking is recommended. And I think I'm off to get a marshmallow from the stall I noticed on my way. In. Oh, lovely. Well deserved. Kit, thanks very much. It looks absolutely brilliant. That's, it looks magic, doesn't it? Yeah, I know. So 37 days to go. I, I mean, I haven't bought a thing, have you? No, absolutely not. So no. time is running out, but let's enjoy the next 37 days I and know. feel and that I know, spirit. Yeah, and we're about to go into the weather now, but it's just the fact that it is just so mild. It certainly is. Here's Chris Page. Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps, sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Hello there. Very good evening to you. After the deluge of heavy rain that we've seen over the last few weeks, yes, the weather for the weekend and today has been fairly quiet. I say for the weekend, at least Saturday, we'll see some spells of sunshine, a chilly day to come before further wet and windy weather once again returns as we head towards Sunday. That's because we've got a little ridge of high pressure working its way in overnight tonight. That gives us a quieter day tomorrow, but then hot on its heels, the next band of rain charging in from the Atlantic, that sweeps its way through and then we're back to blustery showers as we work into Sunday afternoon. But for the rest of this evening and overnight, we've got some clear spells. And actually, where we've got those clearing skies and the winds much lighter than they have been of late, our temperatures will actually start to fall. A little more cloud just creeping its way in along the Kent coast, just holding temperatures up here. But as you can see further west, where there are clearer spells, temperatures could be into mid-single figures. A chillier start then to Saturday morning. That cloud continued to flirt with us along the East Kent coast there, maybe bringing some light outbreaks of rain. But for western areas, lights of Crawley towards the lights of Brighton too, there will be some sunshine, but temperatures 9, 10 degrees Celsius. That's 50 in Fahrenheit. I hear times of high water for tomorrow, looking at Margate there at 7.48 tomorrow morning, and again at 33 minutes past 8 tomorrow evening. As we leave Saturday and go into Sunday, though, that persistent band of cloud and rain charges its way in from the Atlantic. There could bring some very heavy bursts of rain during Sunday morning before that eventually clears out of the way. That could bring a few spots of localised flooding in one or two areas with some blustery showers into the afternoon. That's it from me. Have a lovely weekend. Bye bye. Valent. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. And that's the news to the South East this Friday night. In just a moment here on ITV1, the evening news with Lucrezia Millerini.
For now, though, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much for watching. Happy weekend. See you Monday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.